Thank you for joining us this afternoon um, in, into the evening. I'm Eric Schoenfrey, I'm the head of the Department of Architecture here at Hong Kong U. Uh, with me today, we have several speakers and panelists uh, talking about the different disciplines from architecture to design, landscape. And so it's really exciting today to be able to introduce to you our program because we're going through this uh, time period, especially within this part of the region of the world, where we're rapidly urbanizing. And as we urbanize, there's a lot of questions that are raised about the role that architecture, landscape architecture and design start to play. And the rate of urbanization is actually causing almost a emergency, we could say, because instead of just affecting one city or a whole region, it's starting to affect the globe. And at the rate that we're urbanizing between now and 2050, it's an average of 1.5 million people uh, who are urbanized per week. And that's roughly the size of Hong Kong every, every a bit over a month. So you can imagine that between 2050 uh, and today, there's almost a, a new Hong Kong being built somewhere in the world. And architects have a huge role to play as does landscape and design because we're faced with very large global problems in terms of sustainability, in terms of global warming. And this rate of urbanization has a huge impact on us and on our cities, but also on the world. This is because buildings account for 36% of all global energy use. And what this means is that if we can even make a small efficiency in how we heat or build our, our buildings, we could have a vast impact on the world. And we need more creative minds, but we also need very intelligent minds because architecture is a multidisciplinary subject as is design, as is landscape. And so there's the art and humanity side to architecture, but there's also the science and the technology and even the mathematics and planning side to the discipline. And so it takes not just one type of mind, it actually takes every type of mind. And it helps to be multifaceted, but it's not essential because you can be very good at art or humanities or reaching out and looking into culture and society, or you can be very good at mathematical and technical things and find a way to contribute to the discipline. But if you are in some ways an intellectual polymath, it's even better because it allows you to coordinate and to reach out beyond just very uh, slim realm of knowledge into a wide and vast uh, amount of knowledge. And so the ability to actually think very creatively also ties in with the ability to be uh, very uh, high performing intellectually. In architecture, I often think of as almost the most difficult of all the disciplines. Um, and this is because for, for architecture, there is this idea that you actually have to know a great deal of depth about everything that you do. And also you have to, at the top of that, have a very creative mind. And as we can see that the world is shifting, it shifted from agriculture to industrialization. But this last shift from industrialization into a world of innovation and creativity does take that type of knowledge. It does take that type of education. And it's a unique education that we have in the Faculty of Architecture, where we learn from one another through studio, we learned from one another through asking questions where many of the questions don't have known answers. And so we seek the answers together and the proposals that we make within the studios actually have a far reaching effect. The cities that we see built today had their roots really in the 1920s. And so a lot of the cities that you see today are hundred years old in terms of the mindset that went into them. We're changing that and thinking about what will the cities look like in the next 100 years? How do we educate in order to have people be able to creatively uh, rethink cities completely? And that's why these in disciplines sort of interlink. That's where landscape comes in and influences architecture. And I think you'll hear a bit about this today. And this is where design intersects with landscape or design intersects with architecture that these aren't isolated disciplines. These are actually disciplines that are somehow knit together. And by being part of a wider faculty, this idea of how the disciplines come together is very vital. And we're re-examining um, 
actually the whole curriculum about how we bring people into architecture and how we educate them. One of the things that we're also looking at is this idea that in this region, it's urbanizing very quickly, more quickly than in the rest of the world. So in 20 years, China has urbanized over 300 million people. And in comparison, that's pretty much the US population. It's 331 million is the US population. So imagine building every road, every, every building, every airport, every hospital, every school, every workplace in America, which took 200 years to build and doing that in three years, uh, sorry, 20 years. But the amount of concrete or the amount of cement that went into building China during this a short time period, just three years, was actually the amount of cement that was used in the entire 20th century in the US. And cement's not the most sustainable building material. So you can imagine that we have to radically rethink about how we construct our cities and how we live in our cities and how we imaginatively project into the future. So with me today, we have many, many um, very amazing speakers who are all teaching with us here within the Department of Architecture and also the Division of Landscape Architecture. Our first speaker today is Nazarene Siraji. She's the professor of architecture here at Hong Kong U. Before joining Hong Kong U, Nazarene was teaching at Columbia University, Princeton University, the Architecture Association in London. She served as a chair and full professor at the Department of Architecture at Cornell University, arguably one of the best universities for architecture in the world. I went there as well, so I'm a bit biased, but it's, it's uh, not always number one for like one or two years, it's been like number one for like 20 years or 30 years as well for undergraduate education. And so she has a phenomenal amount of knowledge about the discipline. But she's also the professor of ecology, sustainability and conservation um, before at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and the head of the Institute in Ar of Architecture and Art. She was also the Dean for over 10 years at a school in Paris known as Malachay and has been essentially knighted. I know they don't call it knighted, but it, the equivalent of knighted uh, by the president of the French Republic in France and also by the Minister of Culture in France as an officer of arts and letters. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, thank Nazarene for spending some time with us today uh, to speak about the importance of architecture. Nazarene. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for portraying me as this uh, Superwoman. Uh, I am completely humble. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And if, if I may, and if it's possible, I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, share screen. And here we go. And share. And I hope we're doing this right. And I hope that you see the who I am or who am I. You already introduced me as uh, sort of the, the, the perception of uh, my colleagues and, uh, uh, and my friends and my students. Uh, but uh, the who am I is um, a question that I ask, I have been asking myself for many, many, many years. I'm probably a cowboy uh, that is in love with modern architecture and uh, would like to share that with all of my students, but also all of my friends, but also all of those that are interested in architecture in any way or form or manner. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher that likes to take all sorts of opportunities to teach wherever I can. But I'm also a teacher that um, <clears throat> is extremely engaged in uh, the way that I, uh, that I engage with my students, but also with the projects of my students and how I uh, try very hard to bring all of them to love and appropriate their own projects in the same way that I try to appropriate not only my projects, but also uh, in parallel to their thinking and their way of making things. I share, uh, I am in the midst of my students. I am a part of them, they are part of me. Uh, we learn together, they learn from me, I learn from them. I learn, of course, uh, from them in terms of the contemporary society and the way that they are engaged, but also they are worried about a series of things. 
And I try to bring them to, the, to a position whereby they can feel that architecture can allow them to do many things. Architects always have to convince their public. They need to convince their public in any way that they can. Uh, architecture students sometimes have to uh, be extremely creative in terms of the way that they, uh, they convince us that even a machine, which is uh, going to be completely, completely reliant on technology is architectural, or even uh, when they are trying to be these sort of outer space, uh, fashionable, but also um, in a digital world of an immaterial world, to bring, to bring us to believe that that is absolutely part and parcel of architecture. They also use all sorts of and types of drawings in order to again convince, but they also become both activists, uh, both uh, actors as well as users themselves. We also have to uh, convince not only uh, our clients, but also those people that live in our buildings. This is a building that I finished in 2017, and there is a meeting with all of the inhabitants and the mayor's office, uh, the inhabitants uh, complaining about a series of things that they want from the mayor's office, and the architect being there in order to help them to articulate what it is that they are actually looking for. So architecture, in my mind, stands between two things, very, very uh, obvious. One, which is that thing that we see, that which is visible. But architecture also comes to this visibility from things that are absolutely invisible. So it is extremely important for us to be agile and to be within these two worlds at the same time. Architecture is a very ancient subject. It is full of contradictions. That is exactly why it is potent and impotent at the same time. Architecture is both a thing and an act. At times, it makes you feel extremely hopeful, and at times, it depresses us. Sometimes, it makes us feel that we can change the world, and a few hours later, after a discussion with a client, a teacher, a politician, or a critic, it can make you feel completely ineffective. It is a joyful, it is joyful and it is painful. It is complex. Even though it seems simple, it is very difficult to be a good architect as everyone thinks that they are architects and they should think that way. An architect needs to be like a Swiss army knife. Be able to open a bottle, screw a screw, cut a piece of metal, file a nail, as well as go through an airport x-ray machine without being noticed. We need to be humble. Architecture, architecture makes us humble. Architecture is a beautifully complex discipline. It allows us to think how we can make things that have a foot in the past, but are forward looking. That's why architects have eyes in the back of their heads, but they always go forward. Architects believe in the intelligence of the societies in which they work. Architects need to have a sense of humor, as well as understanding pain and grief. Architecture at HKU offers a unique opportunity to learn and study in a city that is extremely rich in its landscape, in its geography, in the way that it allows for thinking about the capability of mankind to sculpt life from nothing. We want you if you have a huge appetite for being a force of nature. Why study architecture when you can study medicine, law, dentistry, or business? Because you are very, very good uh, Students, students that are going to their higher education that have the capacity of doing anything that they want to do. Look at these pictures, they're quite important for me. I, studied, I started studying medicine. I studied medicine for two years and then I reverted and I went back to that thing that I always wanted to do, which was architecture. Maybe I will tell you in question and answers why I did that, but here there is an image of that. The man's mind is a synthesis of all of those other things. Therefore, the brain can work autonomously. The heart can do too. It needs structure. The brain needs the details of the way that it works. But the architect needs to look at all of these organs at the same time in order to be able to think of the world 
not at the same time, but in a synthetic, but also in a synthesis of these, all of these forms. Architecture is, all, architecture is also fun. I don't know if anybody can tell us who are the teachers in these pictures and who are the students. Well, maybe you can because of the fact that the two teachers are actually holding walking sticks and it basically shows the difference of age that we have with our students. But we are part of the project of our students ourselves. We teach outside as well as we teach inside. The studio is a very sacred place for architects, but as is, walking distances and distances in order to observe what it is that we are responsible for changing for a better life. I asked my students, our students, Tao and myself, who is my co-teacher in this semester, to actually give us three versions of the way that they think that architecture um, is uh, a different, um, a very different uh, field of study. Studying architecture gives you the freedom to explore. Here are the, the three that I, um, I collected. To explore your own interest in design, the structure of the studies are less rigid than conventional textbook-based subjects. Architecture is a field in which you can express your observations, thoughts, and ideas in various forms of representation. You will see the world differently with an architectural mind. The other group has told, has said, sent this one saying architectural study allows us to become aware of the social context environment the environment that we live in the process of studying architecture helps with the development of a critical mindset studying a wide context of an issue also enables individuals to develop their own perspective and stance of the issues that one is dealing with architecture deals with the reality yet the proposition can be imaginative architectural study <clears throat> studies, uh, study is not only a training for the capacity of designing architecture, satisfying the needs of the users or accommodating certain functions, but also a training for observation, critical thinking and speculation. The study of architecture always goes beyond its own discipline. It intertwines with history, cultural context, social conditions, and na natural environments, enabling us to understand the world in a much wider perspective. Using architecture as a medium, we would have the capacity to construct our own positions and communicate ideas and speculations on different issues and situations through drawings, texts, and other uh, representations. This, uh, these three responses make all of us, and I'm sure all of my colleagues, to be extremely proud of the capacity that we have had to convey a set of uh, ex uh, very important issues to our students. Now, uh, just a little um, data uh, for your information. This is a fantastic um, figure that we saw uh, a few years ago in the Biennale in Venice uh, by Rem Kolmas. Uh, it's something that shows the, um, the number of architects around the world per inhabitant. When I was looking at this and I looked at the number of architects that we have in Hong Kong, there are 3,900 architects. I mean, given or I mean, I'm not going to swear by this because there are all sorts of different ways that one can deal with data and the way that one can uh, count these, but uh, this is the closest that I could get to for seven and a half million inhabitants, one architect per 1,920 persons. So you can see where we sit between Italy, which has the most number of architects and the least number of projects and China with the most with the least number of architects with the most amount of um, uh, projects in China, therefore, in terms of urbanization that, um, that uh, the head was just talking about, um, uh, Eric Schuldenfrey. And therefore, I really think that we need to do better than what we are doing right now. So we need you. We need you to be as interested as we are in architecture and the, not only the betterment of the environment, but actually remodeling of the environment. If those of those of you that are interested, you can read my thoughts on the speculations uh, on education. Uh, as uh, Eric said, I have been in this um, the, in, in, ed in education for such a long time that it uh, it is uh, extremely important for me to be able to to articulate that. But in this text, I argue that I think 
that uh, the Grand Tour, which was something that was quite important in the uh, 17th and 18th century as a part of an education of the of the sort of of the bourgeoisie and the better uh, uh, sons more than daughters of the of the affluent um, uh, section of society needs to perhaps become something that architectural education replaces itself with. In the in the old days, we um, and still we look at all sorts of different uh, types of um, buildings, but also all sorts of types of cities as uh, architecture. Of course, the Parthenon and the Temple of Baalbek in, in, in Lebanon today are the two absolute sort of models of the Greek temple versus the Roman temple as the beginnings of architecture. We also always see edifices as architecture. We always see, uh, even if they are edifices that are to do with uh, imagination, uh, uh, of, uh, but then there are also built edifices that become the landmarks of, um, of, um, of countries, of um, nations, of, um, uh, of different uh, cultures. Uh, they are in ver a variety of forms. Uh, you know, there, there's the Sydney Opera House, there's the Seattle Library of uh, OMA, but architecture is also made of the very ordinary, and that is housing. 96% of our built um, mass or substance is housing in the world. This 96%, only a very, very few percentage of that is done by architects. Most of it is done by a variety of um, different uh, disciplines and those that are not, we don't call architects. Because if we remember, architecture is of construction, but not all constructions are architecture. So uh, it's quite important, I think, to think about how architecture can regain perhaps a moment that it has always had in history. And this regaining only happens through the way that we will be working with it as both that ordinary, but both that thing, that action that allows for uh, humanity to be uh, proud of its own production. So, as I said, I postulate that architecture studies today can be the new grand tour. They will allow us to observe very differently. They will allow us to be very, very humble because architecture will become architecture and architectural studies, but also the, 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 uh, the object of architecture will be much, much bigger than us. It will allow us to look at the horizon in a very different way. In these days that we are going through a very different social um, predicament. It will also allow us to reflect and look at what globalization has done, what it, its, um, its pluses and minuses are, where can we come in and find a very, very narrow uh, crack into this globalization that actually allows us to change our worlds for the better again. Therefore, we need the structure and the absolute uh, capacity of our eyes that are completely related to our brains. Housing is living. Housing the living, housing the dead, housing is probably one of the most important issues that we need to deal with, not only urgently, but at least for the next 20, 30, 50 years to come. In Hong Kong, we have fantastic situations. We have situations whereby two completely different conditions and um, things come together. We have housing, beautifully serene, that overlooks and maybe not completely directly, but overlooks something which is the cemetery. This thing that I call the housing for the living, the housing for the dead. What happens in that crack in the middle is something that architecture needs to concern itself with. Architecture is also remodeling the territory. This is a fantastic cemetery in Taiwan by uh, field office architects. It is something that is seen and perceived from many, many kilometers away. But what it actually does 
it has two functions. One, creating a possibility of connecting through a bridge two pieces of the highway, at the same time, housing something which is quite important, serene, looking at the city at a, uh, in, a, in a place whereby you can in fact find that peace that one needs to have in the cemetery. I have probably spent most of my practical and practice life into um, researching, but also working on housing and specifically social housing. Uh, for me, it has always been extremely important not to bring the social as the public, public housing, not social as something which doesn't have any capacity and it is cheap and it is ugly and it is, but something that actually gives not only hope, but the capacity to people to feel that they are being taken care of by who? By architects. Therefore, for me, there is absolutely no difference between designing for those that cannot afford a certain type of lifestyle than those that can absolutely afford everything that they can. So the Palais Royal of Paris is a place whereby it was the housing for the king and therefore a private type of development in the 17th century, of course, which is no different for me as an architect when I'm working for the public sector and also allowing the housing that I'm dealing with to become as not as important as Palais Royal, but as important as a monument that one deals with. Therefore, the cathedral in the background, the social housing in the foreground. Architecture can for us be abstract, but these balconies are both abstraction, but look at the way that I cringe them, I bring them into a point in order not to divide them through a wall, but in order to divide them through a geometry. The way that one looks at the capacity and the possibility of materiality at the de details that one can work with. And therefore allowing for each apartment to become a house in itself, each apartment to have the possibility of being both autonomous within the collective life that it presents itself, but also create um, very, very specific places that you can not only allow for housing, housing to happen, but also for the children to be at ease in terms of going to school, being at ease to be able to play around without thinking that there is going to be a car coming right across the side to them. So, and but then giving these balconies as generous as possible for people to have these huge spaces that I call micro apartments open to the sky. This is of course not thinking, this is thinking before COVID, but I think that the more we go toward uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the problems that we're going to have with climate change, we're gonna need to completely rethink not only social housing, but housing per se. But also the way that architecture can always somehow twink wink at a larger uh, landscape that surrounds it. We are creating punctuations in the scale of landscape. Architecture is always a tiny thing. However, it has a huge, incredible impact on that landscape that it sits within. Architecture always has to also create the possibility for every uh, aspect of both the city, the metropolis, but also the rural to come together. If architecture can make, if architecture can give the possibility to the children to smile, but also the person who goes to their, um, uh, through, their um, uh, through, through a corridor to get to their apartments, to have this possibility of having light, having the uh, capacity of being able to sit down before they get into their, um, uh, to their um, apartments is something that gives the capacity to the architect to be able to, um, to, to intervene within the society that we are working with. Tools, tools for perception, tools for revolution, tools are the things that we need. They were very simple in the 90s. There were tables, we were drawing on the um, on paper. Uh, they became things that we started looking at because there was the screen. Therefore, our perception, the tools have changed the perception that we have 
of the way that we design. We need to constantly be within our time besides uh, the, the, what I was saying earlier on, which is to look at the back of our, through the back of our heads, through the eyes of our, um, behind our heads. But then we need to be completely in the actual time that we are living. In. Join us in understanding the world before changing it for the better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nazarene. That was lovely. And actually, I love your work so much. Uh, and often when we discuss it, I can always see how it touches upon literature, on economics. It's considerate of our society. It reflects on our culture. It's about the challenges we face and how to reframe how we live and how we work. And there's always so much importance that I place in your work because it actually really also heartens the soul in a way. It reminds me, uh, actually, as you were speaking, there's sort of a genius to architecture, uh, a genius to the work. And I was thinking about the MacArthur Fellowship, and it's commonly known uh, in the US, uh, unofficially, it's known as a genius grant. And so many architects have won. And even the ones who might not seem like they're architects actually studied architecture and then went on to win the genius grant. So it's not just the architects who win it, it's actually um, for their architecture, it's actually the education of the architecture, the education of the architect uh, that goes on to produce sometimes lawyers, sometimes artists, sometimes people who study econ economy or business. Uh, for often the undergraduate degree in the US can turn into a master's degree that heads elsewhere. And I, so, I know so many in business and so many doctors and lawyers, but I think there's a real genius about architecture because it is such a difficult profession. It is such a difficult discipline because it touches upon so many areas. So my question is uh, for you, Nazarene, uh, why do we need even more geniuses in architecture? You know, uh, that's, that's what I was trying to sort of bring to the, um, to the attention of everybody. When, we, when we're looking at um, there, this environment that we're in, uh, it's so important to be able to look at it um, in a very, very different way. Meaning that we really need to, um, it's not just having eyes in the back of our heads, but it's to be able to look at everything, their possibilities and their impossibilities, their uh, advantages, their disadvantages. It's this sort of the dichotomy brings a very, very different way of looking at things. This uh, sort of um, everything is not a solution, but at the same time, everything is not a problem. To be able to look at these completely contradictory uh, conditions and to be able to pull out of all these contradictions something that goes beyond each of those and actually adds something else is a kind of a genius, I think, which we need more of it. Because I think that um, since we have we have moved into this uh, sort of, li not line, but to this society of image, we really need to see how we can actually use the, the capacity of the image to reconstruct, uh, uh, remodel the way that we think about our worlds. And I think that that's where uh, it's quite important for architects to, uh, one, of, one of the uh, groups of the students was saying this, that when we study architecture, we begin to look at the world differently. And this is the most important thing I think that we need to bring to the attention of our students. Because once you begin to look at things that are literally something, then it does become literature, as you were saying, because by reading something, there's a word, there's a word that means something, but the way that it's put together, the way that it is um, punctuated, the way that it is, um, that it places itself within a paragraph, it means something else. And I think that that's where um, uh, we, uh, we can be much more effective in this world, in this world that has so much inequality, in this world that is going to have so many problems. This is not the, this virus that we have is probably going to be an easy one. It's going to be what we don't know, which is going to come. And I think that that's where I'm, um, I'm sort of, um, so uh, not only engaged, but so um, ready to say 
that the second part of the 21st century or the third uh, sort of decade, let's say, of the 20th century needs really to restart uh, something that perhaps architecture lost only in 10 or 15 years to it's the top of the iceberg. So we really now need to go back to the bottom of the iceberg. And that's where it's quite important to have, you know, these uh, ideas, but as you call them, geniuses, or as, uh, you know, one could call them as, you know, simply um, a very, very sort of twisted way of looking at things. As Le Corbusier used to say, architecture is not a vocation. Uh, architecture can be a vocation if you would like it to be a vocation. Architecture can be a profession if you would like it to be a profession. Architecture can be a discipline if you would like it to be a discipline. Corb used to say architecture is a twist of the mind. Now, if we can bring that twist of the mind to twist our world, it's going to be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on. I want to linger. I want to stay. I have a million more questions, uh, even for myself, even though I know you so well, it still always provokes another question. Um, I feel it's always like the, we were talking about the thousand and one nights, it, like you can never leave off. It actually provokes the next question the next day. But I do have to pause before we come back to the question and answer later uh, as well and uh, turn our attention to landscape architecture. So for landscape architecture, we're very fortunate to have Vinci Mack here with us today. So Vinci also started within the realm of architecture, receiving a bachelor's of architecture before finding a new vision, uh, which is in landscape, arch uh, landscape architecture. Uh, she went to Harvard University, the Graduate School of Design, where a lot of our landscape architects go for their master's degree. So a lot of our Hong Kong U undergraduates actually end up in the Graduate School of Design at Harvard for their master's degree. Uh, Vinci is not only a landscape architect, uh, but she's also worked in uh, master planning and urban design in Hong Kong and London, Asia, Europe, the Middle East. And her projects uh, are really ones that regenerate cities. Uh, one of the more recent ones uh, was working on the Battersea uh, power station in London. One of the, the great actual uh, it's turning from power station into a much more sort of cultural icon for London. So it's a very important project as well, much more important than the, the words power station might come to mind uh, for those who don't know the project. Also, I always love her teaching uh, because the first course for the undergrads is always so alive uh, with creativity, and with new ways of framing, new ways of thinking of the discipline uh, to studios and the masters that go to Yangon and go beyond Hong Kong uh, to see the effect of, of, of landscape in terms of an ecological vision uh, to finding small moments in our cities, uh, such as uh, studios and work that, that actually look at interstitial Hong Kong, the smaller spaces that might not be noticed uh, without these extra set of attention uh, placed on it. And also we're looking at the concept of a land uh, land art uh, and land visions uh, in the Hong Kong context as an exhibition uh, that you had a few years ago that was uh, very memorable as well. So thank you for joining us today um, and introducing the program. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Nasreen's uh, introduction uh, talk. Um, so um, something I picked up from Nasreen's uh, talk um, earlier, I think it's true that um, the, 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 the overall um, architecture education, um, including landscape education. What I felt was, um, yeah, once you dive into it, um, it does offer a lot of different ways of seeing things, seeing the world. Um, and I think um, in, in our department, um, the different programs do offer a very diverse um, um, opportunities to see things. And so um, our disciplines touch upon a lot, a lot of different aspects of life and society. And so by being an architect, um, landscape architect, I think um, it's, it's a profession, but it's also um, a lifelong journey that you are um, pursuing. You are sort of in search for uh, what's mo most important to you and also um, uh, what you may want to do in life. Um, for um, the more landscape um, uh, introduction of what this discipline is, um, uh, what landscape architects do. Um, 
couple of weeks ago, we actually have um, some short talks from our other faculty members. Um, if students um, are interested, um, please go to our website. Um, we do have those recorded and then please feel free to look at them. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I would like to um, talk more about what our program um, Bachelor of Arts in Landscape Study is. Um, so here you go. Um, so for our program here, um, actually our, our Division of Landscape Architecture, um, we do have a few programs. The, the bachelor level, we have Bachelor of Arts in Landscape Studies. We do have um, uh, MLA. We also have uh, MPhil PhD. And then recently we have a postgraduate post diploma in landscape architecture. Um, the Division of Landscape Architecture is a um, relatively smaller um, uh, division uh, uh, unit. Um, we do have um, a handful of uh, teachers, um, but we also um, have a very close um, uh, working relationship with um, the students. So when you look at the, sort of the numbers, you see that um, we have roughly about 70 students um, in the bachelor program, um, also similar number in the postgraduate um, uh, um, programs. So um, if uh, you are the type of students who would like to interact with uh, teachers a lot, uh, would like to see us a lot, um, we do have roughly a one teacher to seven students um, uh, uh, ratio. Um, so um, yeah, something that we actually are quite proud of. We're able to, to work with students quite closely. Um, we also have a very diverse uh, staff room. Um, we have teachers from, you know, uh, different uh, uh, parts of the world, um, different, slightly different background. Um, and so the, the whole point is to um, allow us to be able to share our knowledge, our experience with you from um, um, different parts of the world, um, different stories and the professional experiences we got. Um, very general, uh, the curriculum chart that you're seeing here is um, giving you some sense of um, the uh, curriculum you may engage with us when you um, join us in the landscape studies program. Um, I will emphasize on the yellow boxes. Um, our um, landscape education is, um, uh, we would say is studio based. So the yellow boxes are actually um, those design studios, um, which all the students sit in this uh, design studio uh, room. Um, and then we engage students with um, different design projects, um, Guide, will guide you through how to actually design a project, um, sometimes with sites in Hong Kong, sometimes as Eric say, uh, as says, we also bring students to different parts of the world um, to um, learn about other places' landscapes. Um, something I also want to point out from here is um, because landscape architecture is actually a very um, broad uh, discipline in a way. We welcome lots of different information, uh, knowledge, expertise from other disciplines as well, um, including ecology, uh, engineering, planning, um, of course, architecture. And that's why um, you see quite a bit of the um, purple boxes, the electives. So besides the landscape courses, we would like you to um, learn um, from the uh, sort of the core discipline, uh, the core knowledge. Um, we also want you to um, sort of get out of this, uh, of our division uh, um, uh, program and perhaps enroll in other, um, other courses from other um, disciplines. Um, can be psychology, music, um, anything that you find from Hong Kong U. To, to, and this is for the purpose of enriching your, your um, uh, university experience and, and to um, equip and expand uh, what you know. That will be in, uh, in important for the um, landscape practice. Um, we also offer a minor in landscape studies. So some students, um, I'm sure at your age, there are so many options, um, so many um, uh, opportunities. Some students, <coughs> sorry, are interested in, in our um, program, but perhaps would like to take another major. Um, if that's the case, that's okay. Um, we offer the minor in landscape studies that you can minor with us. Uh, uh, we, we do see a good um, uh, sort of outcome from having this minor program. Lots of our uh, students in landscape minor 
um, they eventually apply to our masters um, in, in the um, a postgraduate level. Um, or even I, I know from, from experience, some of them um, apply to MLA, the master's program um, elsewhere um, in the world. Um, so um, something as a, as a, um, uh, um, a beginning experience um, to know about landscape, um, but may benefit uh, for your um, future study. Um, so in design studio, um, we um, start with something uh, that is more, um, we would say, understanding that the human scale, um, understanding the, the environment that we live um, uh, with in the first two years. And then we get into the context, which perhaps um, oftentimes we, we work with communities in Hong Kong. Um, and then in the year four, we actually um, lead students to understand landscape as a system, um, how landscape infrastructure works, um, perhaps not just in cities, but also in the um, um, expanded areas into the countryside. Um, and also understanding landscape as a living system, that's very important. These are some of the sketches and models that students make when they first come in. Um, and then um, studio space is always a bit messy, but um, it's, it's good in the sense that um, we understand as students exploring different um, uh, ways of um, um, crafting their, their design, uh, making the models, um, be creative. Um, the way of learning for us is um, uh, very often we get together, um, students show their drawings, show their models, um, and then we have lots of field trips. And this is a photograph taken when we took students to a village um, um, over uh, reading week in Hong Kong, you have reading, we have, we have a week to um, take students to, to do field work if needed. Um, so after being in studio uh, on drawing board to, to you know, draft um, the design, um, we get them to actual site um, to really understand um, the landscape um, from a first person experience. Um, and then our, so to speak, examination um, is um, a, um, in a review format, final review. So what you're seeing in the photograph is a um, student presenting his work um, and then sitting down with the teachers, um, invited uh, critics. Um, sometimes there are other scholars from other universities. Sometimes we have um, practice, practicing landscape architects, architects coming in. Um, so um, uh, this is the format that we often um, will conclude our design studio. Um, the, the three images you're seeing here are actually from our official communications uh, uh, track of courses. Um, so at your age, um, uh, finishing high school, if you're good at drawing, um, that's very good. If you felt that, okay, I don't really know how to draw. Don't worry, um, we do have a series of courses that um, teach you how to do that. So from the more hand drawing type of um, um, official communications, um, that may be where we start. And then in the middle to, uh, to the upper years, we start to get students to, under, to, to learn digital skills, um, how to um, use the different um, digital machines and also how to fabricate. Um, um, uh, pieces to create uh, physical models. As I say, uh, we really value that the, the experience that students um, um, experience the um, uh, real landscape, learn from the, the, the actual landscape. So uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of uh, joint workshops, uh, trying to get students to work with other universities, um, a different landscape um, to learn in a different environment. Um, besides learning from, from the Hong Kong environment. So these are some of the fun photos um, that we uh, take students to, to learn from other environments. Um, this one, we actually took students to Italy. And um, I think uh, for those who know about our program, we do have a very, uh, so to speak, popular capstone studio. This is the uh, final um, semester of uh, year four um, spring terms um, capstone studio um, that we have been running a few years that we take students to um, Myanmar, Thailand, um, and currently we take students to Laos um, to understand um, environmental conservation and development um, in uh, these countries. So this photograph is taken from the um, student instructor by the student instructor, probably on a different boat. 
um, uh, on, on the boat that you see in the photographs, those are you know, part of the student group. Um, these are the works that, uh, well, you can say that, that the sample of student works um, generated from um, the Lao studio two years ago. If you go to our website, you will see more full on um, uh, documentation of the work. Um, so from um, something quite, um, uh, you could say still relating to human scale um, farming um, to more regional understanding. Um, so this capstone studio, uh, we would like students to be able to synthesize all the um, uh, knowledge they, that they get in the, the four years. And that's why it, it, you know, the scale is ranging from, from very you know, human scale to larger scale, um, but also tackling um, issues that are quite contemporary and um, something we would like students to, to understand, to learn. Eric mentioned a bit of where our students uh, go after getting the degree from here. Um, so it is true that we we have a pretty uh, um, we're, we're quite proud that we're able to um, get our students into um, some of the very famous landscape schools in the world um, for the master study. Um, a good number of them do come back to uh, Hong Kong U to um, pursue the MLA, so that's also an option. Um, and um, just to um, Mention a bit about the you know professional qualification. If any of you would like to practice in Hong Kong, um, after getting the MLA degree um, from Hong Kong U, um, the, the the requirement is to have two more years of working experience, and then you can sit for the Hong Kong Institute of Landscape Architects um, license and exam. Uh, if you pass, then you will become a registered landscape architect in Hong Kong. A lot of our students have gone through this, and then you know it's, it's not a big problem. Um, but a landscape architect um, is a, prof um, uh, a profession in Hong Kong. So um, uh, if you want to practice with the registration, then you will have to go through the licensing process. So this is um, the end of my sharing. Um, hopefully you get to understand our program a bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Vinci. That was wonderful. I often think about landscape is almost a formation of two words into one. It's a land and there's scape. And yeah. the, the scape is a, a scene or a view, such as a seascape or a mindscape. But in the way that Hong Kong U has been teaching landscape, it's less about a scene or a view. It's not about viewing onto the landscape. I feel like it's much more about learning from and mm. working within a system of ecology, mm. ecological systems. It's more about sustainability and thinking about actually what landscape has an in, impact on our lives. Mm. Also, I know that the research of one of the researchers within the uh, division, and he often is looking at how viewing onto greenery also reduces our stress levels. Uh, and with reduced stress, we actually live longer, um, which is why I have a plant. Actually, this is the reason I have a plant in my office. I'm trying to live longer. Um, so landscape I see as actually the thing that allows us to live longer, uh, if done right. And when I first came to Hong Kong, I didn't see enough landscape. I mean, we have the mountains, we have a view that you, you at a distance, mm. but I really see that as we envision our future cities, that landscape is actually something that we interact more in terms of ecology, in terms of the human. Mm. Uh, and I'm just reflecting upon uh, your, your ability to uh, have this wide impact on everyone's lives. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone. So our next speaker is Christoph Krola. Uh, he directs the Bachelors of Arts and Science in Design Plus, uh, a new program at Hong Kong U. He has a background in civil engineering and architecture. He has a advanced degree from the Architectural Association in London and a PhD, and his dissertation for his PhD uh, many years ago uh, received the RMIT Vice Chancellor's Prize for Pre Research Impact for the work. He also worked with Pritzker Prize winning architects Zaha Hadid, um, architects. Uh, Zaha is one of uh, my favorite uh, architects. Actually, uh, when she was still alive, she was a very good friend with Nazarene as well. So I think Zaha um, is actually very dear to, to many of our hearts. Uh, and the work that she, uh, her office uh, has already done and continues to do actually. Uh, so her impact is actually felt um, and hopefully will be felt many generations um, from now. His projects have been awarded many uh, prestigious awards. 
And my favorite uh, accolade is a new one. Uh, he's appointed by the International Network for Bamboo and Rattan as a task force expert member in bamboo construction for his work as well. Um, thank you, Christoph, for joining us today. You're on mute, so just, uh, just to warn you. Sorry, right. thank you so much, Eric. I just experienced some glitches in my internet connection, so I hope everything goes smoothly. Uh, bear, bear with me if you have any uh, problems with it. Let me share my screen again, and I hope it works well this time. All right. Okay, we should be good to go. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. Welcome to the huge amount of people that we have in the uh, meeting today. Very excited to present to you uh, the Design Plus program. Um, we had a discussion earlier this afternoon already as well that you can find online where we were talking about all the programs uh, available in the faculty. And it's always particularly difficult to present Design Plus because I'm an architect and I deeply, deeply believe in the story that uh, Nazreen was telling earlier, or that Vinci was telling earlier, and to then come in and try to present an entirely different angle on the, on, on the, the, the problem of designing the world that we're all facing with is, is always a challenge. Um, but I'll give it a shot anyway, because um, I think the, pro the, the program has been created with a very, very visionary idea behind it. And it's very well summarized by this quote uh, from the World Economic Forum. For a student entering primary school today, it's estimated that 65% or more of the jobs they may seek after university do not yet exist. So the speed at which our society is accelerating, the urbanization, the speed at which urbanization is taking place is so fast and it's going at an increasingly rap a more rapid pace that the, the mindset that both Vinci and Nazreen have presented that need to be applied to our built environment, um, whether it's through architecture, urbanism, or landscape, that same mindset requires a broader attention as well. And the Design Plus program has been developed specifically for that, to create a new generation of young thinkers, creative inventors that will um, use their critical thinking, their social engagement, and their knowledge of their disciplines to impact beyond the built environment only. So, we're in our second year now, it's a brand new program um, and Hong Kong University has set up six uh, bachelors of arts and sciences of which Design Plus is one. Some other ones are, for example, applied AI or FinTech or global health and development, um, etc. So the Design Plus program is the DASC that has been set up under the Faculty of Architecture, uh, where it's nested together with its other uh, um, uh, most important design programs. So we fall underneath uh, um, the Faculty of Architecture itself as well. Um, and let me try to explain a little bit about why and how uh, we think and operate. If you, for example, look at the design of a shoe, wherever you go across the world, most of the shoes probably until recently looked like this and the design of shoes may not have changed for hundreds of years, the way they would design them maybe 200 years ago in Italy is probably not very different than the way they were designing them 30 years ago uh, in Paris or in, in London or other parts of the world, who knows. Um, and it was typically done by taking a mold, taking an existing pattern, using leather um, um, and, and cutting it up to compose the shoe as we know it today. Now, very recently, only a few years ago, Nike totally reinvented what it means to make a shoe. Here you see 14 of shoes that they had designed for the Olympics for uh, different uh, disciplines. And these are not made from leather. They don't rely on uh, natural resources. Instead, what they've done is they've used a single um, a filament and they have woven this into a shoe. But this filament is not um, um, uh, made from a natural product. It's actually made from, uh, made from waste. So it's a fully recycled uh, um, polyester uh, that has been used for this. And by doing that, they have so far, or at least at the point of this advertisement, uh, diverted 182 millions of bottles from landfills. And that's quite, that's quite something um, that through designs, through rethinking uh, some of the common objects that we see around us, we can actually have a much broader societal impact than one would normally um, uh, think one could have. So the, the impact that Nazreen and, and Vinci were talking about in the built environment can also be applied in a much broader spectrum. Um, here's another example here. You see all the phones that Nokia developed between 
1982 until uh, until 2007, basically. And you see that they have gone through a huge amount of iterations, constantly relying on user feedback and increases uh, in the technological ability to optimize and further develop their product in an iterative fashion, where through trial and error, um, they went into uncharted territory to create the products that we have uh, now. Um, but here you see another chart where you see that how quickly in only a span of, uh, in this case, 30 years, we went from this very chunky Motorola cell phones to a, a smartphone, which has many fewer buttons on it, a longer battery life, a greater, greater functionality, um, and basically radically, radically changed uh, the way with which we communicate with each other. And this is only 30 years. And this speed is going ex in an exponential fashion. So your children, my children, 30 years from now, what are the devices that they're going to be working with? We have absolutely no idea. So how can we actually train our students to be able to respond to a society that is only more rapidly changing? How can we give them the tools and the techniques and the methods to not be like a deer in the headlight and be run over by all these changes that we see around us, but give them the tools and the techniques to be able to tackle the problems full on with knowledge and expertise through collaboration and come up with a creative design response that allows them to positively impact and contribute to society. In a similar way that, for example, Steve Jobs managed to do uh, with his iPhone. Originally, it was just basically a blank a sheet of glass almost with only an internet connection. And nowadays it's filled with apps and functionalities that make our everyday lives so different than only 10, 12, 13 years ago. Um, so the contribution of this is fast. Now this type of technological advancement continues to happen uh, constantly. Uh, examples are recent upgrades, for example, uh, with the user in mind, for example, uh, easy displays that allow you to limit your usage because at the time, of developing the first smartphones. Nobody had ideas about the addictive nature that this could have. Or for example, figuring out that actually blue light may lead to sleep deprivation and bringing in these new uh, lighting features that allow you to at night have your phone uh, become less, less hostile to you as a person. So this incremental change, this idea of observing what's happening in society, uh, also on a product level um, and learning from it and turning that into an improvement that mindset um, um, is what lies at the core of the thinking of design at Design Plus. So um, the course combines many, many aspects. It's multidisciplinary in nature. So there's aspects of design, of course, but also mechanical engineering, computer science, education, fintech law, AI, and whatnot. It's meant to be a multidisciplinary open course in which students can develop their own passions and interests as well. And the way we teach stands diametrically opposed to how design was, for example, being taught 100 years ago. So here you see the example of how uh, architecture was being taught at the Bauhaus in Europe, um, basically a year ago, where you would gradually build up your knowledge layer by layer until you become um, the building and engineering science specialist at the very end. At D+, however, we're totally overhauling this model because there are no specialists of the future that we're gonna go into. We, we don't know what we're facing at this point in time. So we need to create a setup where we tool ourselves up to be able to respond to that. So this diagram here shows, for example, a problem placed in the middle, and then a team of people surrounding it that are trying to tackle it. We have the student, we have the design professional, that could be somebody that we invite to join the discussion, a subject specialist or an established uh, professional as well. I'm gonna give you a few examples of what um, this approach could lead to, and also the type of careers um, that this could lead to, because the program has been developed with a few reference people in mind. Um, just to quickly mention them, you can look them up uh, later. Um, but here are a series of people that we envision that could be the typical Design Plus graduate in the future. Um, Jane Chen, David Benjamin, Elaine Ng, um, et cetera. You can look up the names later. I'll talk to you through a few of their projects. The first one is from uh, David Benjamin. Say, for example, your challenge is how can you come up with a biodegradable brick, a product that would allow you to, through that, reduce the carbon uh, content, the environmental impact of, your, of the built environment. So that problem would be placed at the center of a framework that we give to students. Um, and then a design professor would come in, maybe a biologist would come in, and an engineer would come in. And together, they would figure out 
uh, how this problem could be tackled. So uh, Dave Benjamin that I just mentioned has uh, is teaching in Colombia, has also this uh, practice uh, itself. And he at one point in time was basically presented with this problem. Um, so by working together with synthetic biologists, etc., they figured out that there's actually ways to tap into these biological computers, say, that allow you to generate and also simulate uh, computationally uh, the processes that you can find in nature that will result in more efficient um, and more environmentally friendly um, uh, design solutions. So they came up with this uh, um, uh, biodegradable brick uh, that's made from bacteria. Um, just another example, as part of that research as well, they figured out that, for example, by looking at uh, certain biological processes, you can see that these microbial environments can actually generate structures that have a very good structural performance that are much more performative than normal materials that you would get, at least in a weight uh, to, uh, uh, to volume ratio. Now, the principles that underlie these can be poured into computational algorithms, and we can simulate that, and we can start to integrate that technology in the broader uh, context, for example, in 3D printed bricks. Um, but again, that same philosophy can then be turned to a very, very practical problem. So for example, Airbus um, approached them uh, with the challenge to design a part of the Airbus itself that had to perform in a certain way, but it had to be as lightweight as possible to reduce the fuel consumption of their air, uh, airplanes. So what they did is they took the outline geometry of the panel that was needed, and then they developed these evolutionary algorithms based on biological principles that would allow the computer in kind of machine learning fashion to design the most optimal solution uh, per weight ratio um, to respond to this design challenge. And that then became the world's first and largest 3D metal printed uh, airplane part ever. So you can see in this example that um, in this case, biology, computational sciences, material sciences are all brought together to solve a very, a very real problem with an environmental uh, positive impact. Totally different example. Let's say you're looking for a type of mobile sensing unit that allows you to collect urban data um, across a town. Um, so we bring together, again, a D-plus student, we bring in an architect, an environmental scientist, and a, mechan a mechanical engineer, and what can be the outcome of that challenge. For example, this bike here that was deployed in Copenhagen, that would allow um, your e-bike to actually become um, um, a notational device that could track pollution, traffic congestion, and road conditions in real time. And once that data is collected, then, for example, a computational uh, uh, specialist like Carlo Ratti uh, can bring all this data together in an interesting interface and make that available in real time for other disciplines like um, urban planners, et cetera, to respond in real time uh, to the challenges that you may have. A totally different example. Again, let's say that you want to set up a company. Uh, D Plus is set up as a program with the idea to create entrepreneurial uh, graduates um, so the founding of companies is, is at the core of the, of the uh, program as well. So say that you want to start up a company. We bring in a website designer, an entrepreneur, a, computer, a computer scientist, and a lawyer in the example case of Ravel, which is a company that was set up um, at Stanford um, as a product of Launchpad, um, which is a program uh, that they have uh, developed there. So Ravel is one of the many companies um, that were successfully founded uh, after coming out of uh, that institute. And today, now that platform brings data on how judges and courts rule in nearly, uh, in nearly 100 motions, uh, bring that analytical data directly available to people in court. So here you see app development, website development, data, science, data services, a radically different part of the design world, but rooted in the same way of thinking um, um, has led to this product. So, as you can see, the Design Plus program is very broad. Um, we focus on design. So we have a curriculum that's built up with, at its core, a series of design studios, five to be precise, that are spread across the four years, leading to a capstone project at the very end. We also have a series of core courses that will equip our students with uh, technical know-how, methodological know-how, historical, theoretical know-how um, that will make them basically a specialist problem solver and designer uh, once they graduate. But where the program really, really stands out within the university is that a very large percentage of its credits can be chosen by the students by selecting second 
major or minor courses from the entire package that the university offers. So we don't claim to know what the future professions will be that will come from this. But what we do know is that our students who have interests and passions, if we can nurture those passions, that they will be able to sculpt those professions further down the line. So through this um, uh, um, choice option that they have, we want the students that come in, we want them to tap into the vast amount of resources that Hong Kong U has as one of the world leading universities in very many different fields, ranging from psychology, marketing, business development, AI, whatever. So we want students that want to um, um, sharpen their own personal interests through uh, the sculpting of their own program within the Design Plus uh, atmosphere. Um, now, the way we teach, as is already obvious from what I've been mentioning just now, is very interdisciplinary. We try to integrate knowledge and methods from different disciplines using real, uh, real synthesis as uh, an approach for this. Um, it's a brand new program, as I mentioned in the beginning. We're only in our second year, but there are some references that you can look at for successful programs uh, internationally that have been uh, using a similar philosophy. The most uh, famous one probably is the MIT Media Lab. Uh, where they have an entire building dedicated uh, to this uh, way of working. But also in London at the RCA, the Royal College of Arts, you'll see uh, that they have uh, a similar mindset in a lot of their uh, programs there. Uh, this chart is, is very interesting because it totally justifies why Hong Kong U at this point in time felt a need for such a program to come, about, uh, to come by. So on the left, you'll see a map of Silicon Valley where you see a series of companies that all have roots in Stanford University. So a 2011 survey estimated that nearly 40,000 active companies can trace their roots back to Stanford. And these companies collectively, um, their estimate economic value would be the 10th largest in the world. And you see companies like uh, Google, Nvidia, Apple, Adobe sitting in there. Now here in our region in the greater Bay Area, the Pearl River Delta, you'll see that we have similar headquarters starting to pop up, Huawei, Tencent, DJI, Mindray, and whatnot. So what we hope and what we're aiming for is that through the teaching that we have here at the Design Plus program, that we'll be able to generate the next uh, group of young entrepreneurs that will be able to disrupt the market and the future in a similar fashion as what we see on the other, other end. Because within a five hour flight radius of Hong Kong, lives half of the world population. Uh, the center of gravity is shifting and we want to be the pioneers um, that drive that change. This graph is particularly interesting for those asking where you might end up once you design, uh, once you graduate from Design Plus. So this is an, a diagram that shows where designers in the UK have ended up after graduating. And you'll see that the vast majority actually ends up in other sectors. From this 71 billion, only 9 billion our designers operating in the design industry. So what this shows is that the philosophy and the mode of thinking in D plus is incredibly valuable to so many other disciplines, whether you go into medicine or in, in mechanical engineering or even in law or whatever, the ability to creatively tackle a problem and bring people from multiple disciplines to the table, get them to talk and the ability to then come up with creative solutions from that is a very unique and difficult skill that is often lacking in the other siloed sectors. And designers can bring, can bring that knowledge uh, to them. Um, here you see the value added uh, by culture and creative industries. And you see that uh, between 2005 and 15 in Hong Kong, design has grown fourfold. So this is a booming uh, sector within Hong Kong's context as well. It's also, um, uh, It's also, uh, as you can see here, uh, employing a greater amount of people over time as well. Um, so within Hong Kong's context, um, there's a great interest from the government in Design Plus as well. So here, or in the design industry. So here you see uh, a quote from, uh, from Paul Chan. The unstoppable way of innovation and technology has swept through the world, fundamentally changing the global economic structure and the way we live and consume. And this he mentioned as he invested an extra 50 billion Hong Kong dollars in funding to boost IT, in addition to the $10 billion he had reserved for that earlier. So the Hong Kong government also sees the value of creative thought. So who are the people that are leading uh, the D plus program right now? Um, Eric Schuldenfrey, who uh, spoke earlier, the head of the Department of Architecture is the founder of the program. And he's teaching a lot of the theoretical and history courses in D plus. 
Um, he's also an entrepreneur himself, has his own company, and and, and so that knowledge is also uh, is is also at the core of what we uh, want to bring to our students at Peak Plus. We have Caesar Jung Harada, who is coming more from a product design background, a very different field than architecture. Um, he is the director of Maker Bay and is uh, very, very engaged in education, social, entrepreneur, uh, social entrepreneurship. Um, and you have to check out his profile. He's done some fascinating work um, across the region. Um, uh, a very, very warm person. Um, so he's teaching a lot of the courses uh, as well. And then myself, as I mentioned, I come from an architecture background, but if you look at the type of work that we're doing, it's again, much more multidisciplinary borders on, on, on material science, uh, structural engineering, um, which is why it fits very well in the D plus uh, context. Now, as the program continues to grow, we'll uh, bring in more people. Uh, we're now in our second year, it's a four year program. So as the program grows, you'll see more great minds coming in um, to help us develop the project. Um, you can find more information on the website. So this is the D plus website on the BS on the BASC uh, website and on the Faculty of Architecture website. Um, you can also find some of the talks. Here you'll see a nice TED talk of uh, Caesar, um, how he was teaching kids to love science. Um, we also have an Instagram web page. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions after this talk, you'll be able to talk to uh, some students as well. And we're always available to give you more uh, information. So thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing you uh, in the question section. Thank you, Christoph. So the next we have a virtual tour. So Roberto Riquejo uh, will be uh, sharing the virtual tour with us. Roberto. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks everyone for, for staying with us uh, for this long. We're gonna shift gears now a little bit and try to give you a bit of a sense of where all this, all these insights, all, all this uh, magic happens. Uh, so I'm gonna start sharing the screen. And uh, we're gonna have a few students also join us in this virtual tour. Two students from third year BAAS, another two students from fourth year BAAS, and also Christian Lange, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Architecture, and also the leader of the robotics lab. Uh, so essentially, I imagine most of you are in Hong Kong or nearby, so you might get a sense of of what you're looking at. This is Hong Kong Island, uh, Victoria Harbor, uh, Nolving, uh, which essentially hosts uh, the, pro the programs that, that we've been discussing today, Design Plus, the BAS and the BALS are all happening in this white cube. And as you can see, the location is, is, uh, is very special. The campus in general is located in, uh, on a slope and right in between essentially what is this very dense dense urban context and a very lush uh, green uh, subtropical jungle. Uh, so the campus is very green and has wonderful views uh, as well. Um, Ashley and, um, and uh, Tina, are you there? Yep. Hi. All right. So this is a, this is a sort of 3D 360 view of the building in question. Um, I'll pan around it so you can get a bit of a sense of the space. Uh, uh, Athena, if you can tell us a little bit about the building, uh, at least from your personal experience. Sure. Um, well, I'm studying in year three right now and we're using the second floor studio. Uh, it's quite an open space with like glass walls and it's really convenient because this is close to the computer lab and also fabrication labs where we can do woodworking, laser cut and concrete casting. So it's somewhere that I spend a lot of my time at, but I've also used the third floor studio in my past year. Um, it's the biggest studio that we have uh, you, and it's shared by different years. So it's quite nice because all the walls are actually pinned up walls and we can always see what other year students uh, have like, are doing in, for the studio. And so like, we can just walk around and check out what what they're up to. And it seems uh, like you're in the building at the moment, is that right? Hmm? Are you in the building at the moment? Oh, I'm not there now, but I see the year four is art. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, as as uh, just for everyone's info, uh, we will be providing the links to these 360 views. And you can you can see that some some of these some of these tags 
will allow you to see some videos uh, that will give you additional information on each of the programs. So there's a link for the BAS, another one for landscape, and also another one for design plus. Um, Ashley, uh, yep. can you tell us a little bit also about your experience with the building? But now it can also be the exterior uh, or the public spaces are around it. Um, I tend to, I mean, studying architecture, you will spend a lot of time indoors and sometimes it's um, it's it's more comfortable and better if you go outside and get some fresh air. So I tend to go to the lily pond. Um, so the sort of the steps overlooking the lily pond, they're my, um, it's my de designated sort of lunch spot. Um, it's really nice. It has a really nice scenery, um, especially now the weather is really nice. So there's a nice breeze. Um, this cow this courtyard outside the nose building is also quite um, um, interesting because a lot of different clubs um, and societies um, host different activities and sometimes we could just look out the window we could have um, you know a full view of what's going on so that's mm -hmm. also really cool yeah nice thanks uh, for sharing I'm gonna jump into the fourth year studio uh, Ella are you there I'm here am I turning your camera on Okay. Uh, so this is uh, what a studio looks like. And uh, the reason I asked Ella to join is because she was the only one that was in the space when I captured uh, the room. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in this room? Why is there so much stuff? What, what are these drawings? What are you guys investigating? Yeah, so uh, the year four studio, uh, is, well, the year four uh, studio project right now, as usual, is about housing. Um, so you can see a lot of these uh, like housing block type of models uh, and um, we're working in different ways so some students are working more with models and some are working more with drawing uh, so that's also you can see on the panels um, around the studio uh, that we have different modes of working so I also agree it's really uh, fun that you can kind of go around and look at people's projects and it's quite a social space I think where we exchange ideas. Uh, so is this ex exclusively a place of working or do you also get to present an exhibit in the space? Well, we do discuss our projects with our tutors uh, in this space. Uh, so although we do not uh, do our like big presentations here, um, we definitely use this space for a lot of different things and different courses as well. Um, so yeah, you can also see elective models. Um, okay, uh, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, hey, Jin. Hey. So this is a very different space. Uh, it's much neater. Uh, and it's filled with equipment. This is the 3D printing lab. Can you tell us a, a bit about how you use this space, if you've used it in the past, and maybe what these machines are for? Yeah, uh, the 3D printing facility in Hong Kong U has numerous printers that help us quickly test like multiple design concepts and make iterations in the early phase of the projects. And I think we have eight FDM PLA printers, two composite powder printers, and one industrial grade ABS printer. And um, the FDM stands for like fused filament uh, fabrication, which allows us to uh, produce iteration models and even like big presentation models, pieces by pieces. And we largely in Hong Kong, I think use PLA, a bioplastic, and we have options to of course print ABS and powder. Um, a lot of students right now are currently using them because these printers in Hong Kong U are fast and accurate and our ideas and experiments are materialized in real time. Of course, for me, I use it really often. And these facilities are really accessible for us because we can, we can like, um, we have portal system allowing us to conveniently book and communicate with full-time staffs uh, who help us like navigate these facilities, right? And yeah, uh, experiments right now with uh, students' experiments are like made possible because of these facilities. and. Yeah, through these thank you, thank you. Sounds really interesting. Uh, I'm going to jump into the robotics lab, uh, Christian. Yep. <clears throat> Hold on a second. There we go. Um, what is this space? Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening here? It's uh, it doesn't look like a studio. Uh, it's a lab. And uh, maybe you can guide us through it and tell us uh, what all these robots can do and what they're being used for. Sure. Yeah. So the robotic fabrication lab, um, we have it since four years. Um, and it's uh, one of the first ones 
first labs in Southeast Asia dedicated to the research of robotic fabrication in architecture in the built environment and the first one in Hong Kong. So as of now, we have four robots um, that have various kind of, which you can equip with various end effectors and work with various materials. Um, as end effectors, we have 3D printing, which you can uh, utilize for clay printing or for concrete printing. Uh, we have 3D milling uh, hats to kind of work on uh, timber. And we have also like hot wire cutting so we can cut um, various plastics with it. And, um, um, and then we have also, we recently got like a, a set of grippers. So these grippers are kind of basically automatic hands so they can kind of start uh, to assemble actually um, components to an actual model. So yeah, this is kind of uh, pretty much like in short what the lab is about. So the lab is kind of like it's a research facility. We are focusing currently on um, 3D printed uh, ceramics, but we also kind of use it in, in teaching. So we teach a studio in the BAS and as well in the master uh, and as well electives, which are accessible to, to uh, students in the BAS and in and the, and the masters. Can you tell us a little bit about this piece that I'm trying to zoom in into? into? Yeah, so this is a project we recently um, uh, collaborated with uh, um, colleagues in the Faculty of Marine Biology. Um, and so this is a project uh, where we 3D printed 128 tiles, like this is one of those, uh, which are artificial coral reefs. And they were um, in, um, installed in early July in Hong Kong waters and uh, a set of, uh, on each tile where there were around uh, six coral fragments. And these are uh, supposed to kind of basically um, boost new coral uh, life in Hong Kong waters. So this is an experiment, um, it's a research project with uh, the School of Biology, Marine Biology. And we'll go for the next two years, like they will monitor like the success um, and so we're very excited about it. So it's an it's, um, uh, exciting project because it's also uh, cross-disciplinary. So exciting to learn uh, some other sites outside architecture um, and how that also can contribute to, um, our, to the betterment of our society. Yeah, I think it sounds like a very exciting project and it, unconventional in the sense that, it, you know, it does go beyond somehow the scope of the architect and and has real impact uh, well, uh, and an ecological dimension. Yeah, though it, it, it deals with habitation. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Good point. Um, okay, so the virtual tour is now complete. And um, what we are going to do now, we're going to end the session in a few minutes, uh, but we are going to break into three different uh, rooms uh whichever one you are interested in joining please take note of the zoom links or or scan the qr code i will also type in the the zoom link on on the chat box so you can easily click on it um and i i will leave this uh, for you to click for a few minutes Hold on a second. There's also a prospectus that's been published. Uh, so if you wish for a prospectus, you can always come to Hong Kong U to get one uh, in the Department of Architecture. There is also a way that we can send it to your school. So if you're interested and you think a few other people might be interested in the program and you uh, wish for a few uh, versions of it, there's also an overview of the entire faculty as well. So you can get to know more about the faculty uh, through the overview. Uh, so please uh, let us know if you're interested in receiving like a, the printed form of the, the prospectus. Uh, I believe we've already shared with you uh, in the chat the prospectus link. Uh, you can also find the, both of these on uh, our website as well. So if you wish to download it instead. Yeah, almost there. All right. Wonderful. So, Robert, are you sending everyone? Yeah, there they are. Okay, great. The links are there. And I will also share with you uh, the links of the, the uh, 360 views so everybody can take a look at the spaces in their own time. 
and also watch the videos. So thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to learn more about the, the Department of Architecture uh, and landscape and also design. And we really appreciate also all our students uh, for participating in this as well. Uh, it's very nice of you to join us on a, a Saturday and Halloween, no less. Uh, so it's very, very kind of you. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Nazreen uh, and also Vinci and also uh, Christoph for all those wonderful uh, discussions. And we hope to see you in Hong Kong U next year uh, to continue these type of discussions uh, in the various programs as well. Thank you. All right. So see you guys soon in the Q&A session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.